Hey guys, Kiwi here. In this video, I'll be breaking down every episode of Better Call Saul Season 2 and ranking them in a tier list. Warning is spoilers for Better Call Saul Seasons 1 and 2, and let's jump right into this. Season 2 Episode 1, Switch. The Season 2 Gene scene starts with showing Gene and his fellow co-workers closing the Cinnabon for the night. Again, I love the music and how it relates to Gene's current situation. Gene goes to throw out the trash and he gets locked in with the dumpsters for the night. Gene is so scared of setting off the alarm and alerting the police that he sits there all night long and waits for the morning janitor to open the door to let him out. Also gotta love the SG was here that Gene carved into the wall. The current timeline starts with Jimmy rubbing Marco's ring before he goes into the courthouse to meet Kim Howard and Cliff for his new job. This is revealed to be the same moment from the end of the season 1 finale, but the season 2 premiere shows that Jimmy actually did go in to talk. Jimmy pulls Kim aside, asking her if they'll date if he takes this new job, but Kim doesn't give him a clear answer, so he declines the job and leaves to go talk to Mike, which is where we got the final moment from the season 1 finale. I love how they cut this together, where in season 1 you think he just turns around and leaves, when in reality Jimmy actually actually did go inside. Jimmy didn't feel right due to the thoughts of Marco, and then he used Kim as an excuse to not take the job. Jimmy would much rather con for a living than work a legitimate job. Price goes to pick up Mike for another meeting, but Mike refuses to get in his new flashy Hummer. But I like it. I mean, I'm proud of it. Good. And you'd be proud of it on your own time, but not with me. I'm not getting in that. Price then fires him and goes to meet Nacho alone, which proves to be a very bad idea as Nacho talks him up and distracts him, allowing him to secretly look at Price's ID and find out where he lives. I also love how Nacho tells Price that he trusts him, when we all know that Price shouldn't trust him back. I trust you. Great. Thank you. As we know from season 1, Nacho likes ripping off thieves because they have no recourse. Except Price is stupid enough to actually call the cops, who become very suspicious of him for obvious reasons. Without Chuck or Kim as motivation, Jimmy no longer has any interest in being a lawyer. Kim meets him lounging in a pool, and they end up talking in the bar where they commit their first con together. Okay then, what's the plan? Season 2 is where they reinvent Jimmy and Kim's relationship, as they must have figured out what they wanted to do with Kim. With Marco dead, Jimmy manipulates Kim into conning with him, showing her the ropes. She plays along, and slipping Kimmy is born. Fun fact, the Ken guy that they con here is the same guy that gets his car blown up by Walter White in Breaking Bad. Now afterwards, Jimmy and Kim kiss on screen for the first time, blossoming their relationship over the rush of their first con. It's wild that this is what brings them to Together, but knowing future seasons, it all makes perfect sense. This is also the origin of Kim's bottle stopper. That's a keeper. <laughs> I love the chemistry between Jimmy and Kim, and it really starts to show in this episode, such as Jimmy using Kim's finger to brush his teeth. Go, well, I'm fine with that. Yeah, me too. Wait till you see what I floss with. <laughs> Kim agrees with Jimmy that they wish they could do that every night, but sadly they can't. Hey, wouldn't it be great if we could do that every night? Yes, it would, but we can't. With Jimmy back at the pool from the beginning of the episode, he starts leaving Kim voicemails telling her he sees someone that they can con, but he eventually realizes that Kim was right and that they can't go on con sprees every night, so he calls up Davis in Maine to take the job. This is kind of Jimmy trying to fill the void from the death of his friend Marco. The episode ends with Jimmy and his new office office at Davis and Maine, where he flips a do not touch switch on his office wall. Nothing happens and he seems disappointed. This is what the episode title is named after. It really speaks to Jimmy's character that he's already instantly bored and depressed with a solid and legitimate job working on his sandpiper case, already looking for mischievous excitement. This episode gets a B tier. I ended up really enjoying all of the Slip and Kimmy stuff considering that we know where these characters end up in future seasons, such as everything in regards to the bottle stopper that Kim keeps. Although I now appreciate this episode more than when I first watched it considering I know what happens in future seasons, I want to rank this episode specifically on my impression watching it instead of giving it a higher score due to what happens in future seasons. Season 2, Episode 2, Cobbler. Squat Cobbler. Squat Cobbler. Squat Cobbler, you know what Squat Cobbler is. No, I don't, I don't know what a Squat Cobbler is. No, me neither, what is it? The episode starts with Chuck playing a song on the piano, but restarts due to messing up at the same spot repeatedly. As someone who plays piano, I can definitely relate. A notable detail is that at the top of the sheet music, it's titled Rebecca, but more on that later. 
Howard visits Chuck and updates him on Jimmy working at Davis and Maine, saying that the elders kept asking for Jimmy and that Kim vouched for him as well. Howard admits that he didn't stand in the way of Jimmy, like how Chuck made Howard do to Jimmy for years at HHM. Chuck is surprised but fakes excitement for Jimmy and also tells Howard that he might start coming into HHM again, which we'll see later in the episode. As Howard leaves, we can tell that Chuck is unhappy as he sits at his piano, unable to play. Jimmy and Kim have a smoke at their classic season 1 spot after a Sandpiper case meeting at HHM. Jimmy updates Kim on his job and Kim is happy for him. This is also where Kim gives Jimmy his iconic world's second best lawyer coffee mug. Jimmy's excited for his new company car, but he gets frustrated when his new coffee mug won't fit in the cup holder. This is an obvious metaphor for Jimmy not fitting into his new job. Everything's going well for Jimmy with his new job, until Chuck decides to show up for a meeting at HHM, clearly because Jimmy working at Davis and Maine bothers Chuck so much. I like how Jimmy already knows what's happening before Chuck arrives, due to everyone's phones being confiscated. This starts the ongoing theme this season of Chuck butting into Jimmy and Kim's affairs instead of just focusing on himself. This throws Jimmy off at first, but he snaps out of it and continues the meeting. Meanwhile, Price appears to be at Mike's toll booth and updates him on how he was robbed. Mike convinces Price to leave the cops alone by saying that he'll find his baseball cards himself. Mike then goes to Nacho at his dad's shop to warn him about how Price was stupid enough to go to the cops. I'm not stupid. Mike convinces Nacho that this is both of their problems and that Nacho will make 60k if he plays ball. This was also our first introduction to Nacho's dad, and I love how sincere the father is while trying to help Mike reupholster his car. Mike, Nacho, and Price meet up, and Price traded his Hummer for his baseball cards back. Price's reaction to Nacho dismantling it for parts is hilarious, along with Nacho's explanation of why he won't keep it. He deserves the best. I'll make sure the boys at the chop shop are real gentle with her. Wait, why? No. You think I'd be caught dead driving that thing? It looks like a school bus for six-year-old pimps. Alright, shall we move this along? I love this interaction. Mike hires Jimmy to represent Price and get him off the hook with the cops, but in order to do that, they need to execute the iconic Squat Cobbler story. This is an incredibly funny moment for the show, and it's what the episode is titled after. What the hell is a squat cop? It's when a man sits in pie. He sits in a pie, and he... He wiggles around. Fun fact, there's a DVD bonus scene that actually shows the tape of Price sitting on a pie. The episode ends with Kim laughing at Jimmy's cobbler story until he admits that he falsified evidence and that they're eating one of the extra squat cobbler pies. Kim is upset and says that Jimmy can't tell her about illegal activity anymore, but not that he shouldn't do it. Remember this moment in regards to the evolution of Kim's character. This episode gets a B tier. Not only do I enjoy Mike and Nacho's situation with Price, but the squat cobbler is hilarious. Now on the flip side, some of you may be wondering why I only gave the cobbler episode a B, as the episode is a fan favorite. This is because although I love Mike and Nacho's situation with Price, and I love Jimmy's situation with Price with the squat cobbler, that really only is two scenes that stick out to me out of the whole episode. So although I really do love those two moments, those are just two highlights from an overall middle of the road episode. Season 2 Episode 3 Amarillo. This episode starts with Jimmy swindling a Sandpiper bus driver to stop so he can coerce elder clients in Amarillo, which is what the episode is named after. Slip and Jimmy strikes again, politely manipulating them, and I do enjoy watching Jimmy talk to elders, but there's a slight sinister tone considering that you know that he's manipulating them. And I do love the cinematography of Jimmy leaning against the wall at the beginning of the episode. During the next Sandpiper meeting at HHM, Jimmy gets praise from Cliff for all the elders that have signed up, but Chuck passive-aggressively calls Jimmy out for soliciting the elders. This is Chuck continuing to butt in on Jimmy due to being jealous and irritated that Jimmy is working for Davis and Maine, calling Jimmy out on taking shortcuts again. Jimmy tries playing footsie with Kim during the rest of the meeting, but this time Kim does not reciprocate. Kim clearly realizes that Jimmy did solicit the elders and that Chuck was right. Jimmy never told Kim due to asking not to be told about these things at the end of the last episode. So not only is Chuck checking Jimmy, he's creating a strain between Kim and Jimmy. Jimmy realizes this, so he interrupts the meeting again to backpedal. After the meeting, Jimmy confronts Kim, saying that the ends justify the means, and that Chuck never called Jimmy out for solicitation back when he was clearly doing it when they were originally creating the case together. Jimmy knows that Chuck has it in for him due to taking the job at Davis and Maine. Kim then tells Jimmy to be more careful in the future because anything sketchy that 
that he does reflects back on her as she got him the job in the first place. Jimmy tries doing this job the proper way at first, but it doesn't turn out, so he talks to Cliff about creating a TV commercial. Cliff says that they'll talk next week, but Jimmy is impatient, so he creates a commercial on his own and airs it without Cliff's permission. This works, but he gets in huge trouble with Cliff by the end of the episode. This is where we see the creation of Jimmy's Need a Will Call McGill commercial, which I do like, and I do love any excuse to have his camera crew cameo. Since Jimmy directly went against what Kim said earlier in the episode, he lies to her about Cliff allowing him to run the commercial. This is also where we get a hint towards the Ice Station Zebra theory. Meanwhile, Mike drops off more money for Stacy and Kaylee. Stacy tells Mike about gunshots that she keeps hearing overnight, so he secretly stakes out her house to see for himself. Although there is a chip in their house, it turns out that Stacy was paranoid and that she could just be hearing the morning newspaper being thrown to each house in the morning. The next day, Stacy tells him that she hears gunshots again, but Mike knows this is impossible as he was outside her house all night long, but he can't tell her this as she told him not to do it in the first place. Caldera calls Mike late at night, saying that some guy specifically wants Mike for a high paying job, and when he goes to the meet, it's revealed to be Nacho, and that he wants Mike for a hit, but we get left on a cliffhanger in regards to who Nacho wants dead. This episode gets a C tier. It's an okay episode, but very forgettable. It just builds Chuck trying to be a nuisance for Jimmy and Kim, along with hinting at Ice Station Zebra, which I have a full video on. Also, Stacy being paranoid honestly turned out to be pointless. As much as I want to like Mike's family, they get some of the most boring story arcs throughout the show, as it seems like the writers struggle what to do with them since they already completely covered Mike's backstory in 5.0 during Season 1. Season 2 Episode 4, Gloves Off. This episode starts with a flash forward to Mike brutally beaten up in his home, implying that Nacho's job for him didn't go as planned. This was a great intro that definitely hooked me on the episode. Then going back in time, we see Nacho and Mike planning on how to take Tuco out. I love Mike pointing out all the holes in Nacho's plan. Someone comes in behind me, I'm blocked. Who's gonna put him behind you? Well, I'm guessing someone who likes tacos. What then? What's my exit? I don't know. Get out and run. Bad knees. Which results in Mike changing the plan, saying that he'll snipe Tuco from a distance instead. I also love how Nacho describes Tuco. But when he's using... Loco, crazy. First by telling the story about how Tuco killed a henchman in front of him, then Nacho explains Tuco's internal lie detector. Tuco, he likes to get face to face. Says everything he needs to know is written right here. Some in the eyes, just stares like he's looking inside him. I've seen him go like that five, ten minutes. And what does that accomplish? He calls it his lie detector which we see later on when we see Crazy 8 meeting with Tuco and Nacho, which I believe is Crazy 8's first appearance in Better Call Saul. We get a scene of Mike looking at illegal sniper rifles to purchase from Lawson, who is the Breaking Bad character that sells Walt his 38 snub in Breaking Bad to try and kill Gus with. Mike ends up not getting anything. We also learn through implications that Mike maybe was probably a sniper in the past. Mike meets up with Nacho again, saying he won't do the hit. He convinces Nacho that killing Tuco is a bad idea, so instead they'll set up Tuco to get arrested. Mike calls the cops across the street on a payphone before going in to confront Tuco, showing that he's planning on getting into the fight. Mike purposely hits Tuco's car while parking, then plays dumb to the point that Tuco tries robbing him as payment. Mike pulls out his wallet with a bunch of cash to pay for food, showing that he has money. He then walks outside, causing Tuco to follow him. After Tuco takes all of Mike's money, you can hear cop sirens in the distance. Nacho leaves, but Tuco stays, with Mike holding holding on for dear life, getting the crap beat out of him as cops pull up, catching Tuco in the act. Now we know why Mike's face was so beaten up at the beginning of the episode. Later that night, Nacho meets Mike one final time to pay him. I love what Nacho says here to Mike, in regards to going through all that effort and pain, along with getting less pay, just so he doesn't have to pull the trigger. This is the beginning of Mike's character arc changing for the worse, as Mike becomes more corrupt and eventually learns to pull the trigger. You could have gotten twice as much for one tenth the hassle. You would have done the world a favor. You wouldn't look like someone took a lead pipe to your face. Plus, when Tuco gets out, get the point. Just saying, you went a long way to not pull that trigger. This is the antithesis of no half measures. What Mike did with Tuco was a half measure, and by the time we know Mike in Breaking Bad, he's changed to only taking full measures. Meanwhile, during Jimmy's side of the episode, he gets in shit from Cliff for the commercial, but tries stressing to him that the ends justify the means. He gets told that the reputation is worth more than this case, and that if Jimmy does something like this again, that he'll be fired. 
Jimmy tries calling Kim to warn her, but it's too late. Kim's already in a meeting with Howard and Chuck. Kim gets in trouble for not telling them about the commercial, even though she didn't know that it wasn't approved. Kim warned Jimmy, and now she's getting punished for his actions, no doubt thanks to Chuck having it out for both of them. Chuck once again leans a heavy hand on Howard's shoulder, causing him to heavily punish her. Jimmy goes to see Kim at HHM and finds her in Doc Review. Jimmy tries saying that he'll talk to Howard, but Kim says it'll just make things worse, and that they're done romantically if he does. Jimmy takes this as they're not currently done, so he apologizes and leaves. Jimmy then arrives at Chuck's place, and finds Chuck in a great deal of pain due to his condition. Even when Jimmy's mad at Chuck for getting Kim in trouble, he still comes to Chuck's aid when he sees him in pain. Jimmy stays at Chuck's until morning, not just to see if he's okay, but to also accuse him of putting his health at risk in order to punish Kim. But management of personnel, those decisions are all Howard's. <laughs> that is rich. Now tell me, when Howard was making his management decisions, was he sitting on your knee with your arm up his ass? Chuck denies Howard being his puppet, as Howard recommended Jimmy to Davis in Maine. Hey, can he talk? Will you drink a glass of water? That's uncalled for. And if Howard were my puppet, he certainly wouldn't have recommended you to Davis in Maine. Although that may be true, Chuck returning to the office definitely has influence on Howard's actions against Kim. It seems as though Chuck won't allow Jimmy and Kim to be happy, as he's trying to stick a wedge between them to get back at Jimmy for conning his way through his job. Now, Jimmy says that if Chuck is mad at him, to take it out on him and not Kim. But Chuck prefers being manipulative and passive-aggressive. Don't punish Kim. If you're mad at me, take it out on me. Chuck lied to Jimmy's face by going to great lengths to convince him that Kim's punishment has nothing to do with him. Chuck always acts so righteous as an excuse for his malicious vendetta against Jimmy. I know you like to think the world revolves around you, Jimmy, but this has nothing to do with you. But as much as I like to turn against Chuck, he does have a handful of good points. Kim did have a lack of judgment thinking Jimmy wouldn't get into more trouble, turning Kim into his accessory. You see, that's your problem, Jimmy, thinking the ends justify the means. And you're forever shocked when it all blows up in your face. What did I do that was so wrong? Jimmy also thinks that the ends justify the means and gets surprised when it blows up in his face, making Cliff look bad for airing the commercial without his consent. She knows you. She should have known better. You are such an asshole. Why? For pointing out that her one mistake was believing in you? It's true that Chuck and Howard didn't know that Jimmy lied to Kim about already having the commercial approved when he didn't, and that if they knew this, they would have possibly been less harsh on Kim, but at this point, the damage is done. And I would never say that. Why not? Because if I were impeding the career of one of my employees for the purpose of compelling you to do something against your will, that would be extortion. Yeah. It would. So? You gonna extort me, Chuck? Regardless of what Chuck is saying, bottom line, he's still extorting Kim and Jimmy, but refuses to admit it, as he's too righteous to admit that he's doing something illegal or immoral to himself, let alone anyone else. You want perspective? I'll give you mine. You're my brother. And I love you. But you're like an alcoholic who refuses to admit he's got a problem. This episode gets an S tier. I absolutely love everything in regards to Mike and Nacho framing Tuco, as it's always great to see anything involving Tuco, and as you may know, Mike and Nacho are my favorite characters as well. So anything involving the two of them, I'm a bit biased towards. Even having the small Breaking Bad cameos such as Lawson and Crazy 8 boosts this episode in my opinion. I also love when Jimmy confronts Chuck, along with all the back and forth between them. Let's say Jimmy? Come on, Chuck, extort me! Say quit, and I will quit, but I need to hear it from your mouth. You want me to commit a felony? because that's what you do, right? One reason why I love the Chuck and Jimmy dynamic so much is they have both valid points against each other, resulting in the battle between them feeling like an endless rabbit hole. Because you wanna believe that deep down I'm some hypocrite. Let's find out. Come on down, Chuck. Roll around in the dirt with me. All your dreams will come true. Season two, episode five, Rebecca. This episode opens with a very important flashback to Chuck introducing his ex-wife to Jimmy over dinner. Chuck's lifelong resentment for Jimmy truly shows here, as he's just so uncomfortable with how much Jimmy and Rebecca get along. In reality, Jimmy's just trying to make small talk and tell jokes in order to make a good first impression, but Chuck has always resented Jimmy for how charismatic and likable he is. To further prove Chuck's jealousy over Jimmy's charisma, Chuck tries telling a joke to Rebecca later in bed, but it falls completely flat as Chuck doesn't have a charismatic bone in his body. Back in the main timeline, Jimmy leaves Kim a voice 
voicemail message that he wants to make things right. He then gets surprised by associate Aaron Brill, who's definitely in the running for top 5 most annoying Breaking Bad Better Call Saul characters. God damn, Pixie Ninja. But by all means, just as I say whenever I hate a character, the actor must have done a really good job for the character to become so hateable. Anyways, Jimmy goes to see Kim and Doc review again to try and hatch a plan to help her, by trying to convince her to sue her own firm. Jimmy says that Chuck is extorting them, and that he can even quit Davis and Maine if he needs to. Kim denies this and insists that she'll get herself out of trouble. This is where we get the iconic That would be career suicide line from Kim, along with the even more iconic line you don't save me, I save me. This is also where Kim originally finds her Mesa Verde connection after two long montages of her calling numbers in the stairwell. This puts emphasis on how hard she truly hustles when she has her mind to it, but that being said, I'm not sure if two full montages were necessary. One is Kim just talking on the phone, while the other has music. Maybe they could have combined the two with music only starting halfway through, Absolutely. I'll tell him right now. I'm sure we can get something on the books tomorrow. Thank you, Paige. Okay, bye. After the second montage, we get the great moment of Kim standing alone in the underground parking lot screaming, yes, and doing a happy dance once she finally gets that Mesa Verde connection through Paige. a great payoff to her arc throughout the episode. Jimmy pulls up to Mike at the toll booth after Mike gets off the phone with Stacy, and Jimmy asks Mike what happened to his face. I also love how Jimmy introduced Aaron and Mike to each other. Uh, let me introduce you. This is my babysitter, Aaron. Aaron, this is my grandpa, Mike. Speaking of Aaron, did I ever mention how good she is at being a pain in the ass? Mommy? What are you doing? That's a bribe. Is there any possible way we could still get Thursday? I'll give you 2.30 Thursday, the 14th. That's next month. We get another Bill Oakley interaction with Jimmy, and Oakley just gushes over how jealous he is about Jimmy's new Davis and Maine job, considering the company car and the company apartment that he was given. This is yet another example about how Jimmy doesn't appreciate or even care about all the good legitimate job opportunities that he gets, which other people would kill for. Lucky bastard. The next day, Howard joins Kim to introduce Paige and Kevin to HHM, but afterwards, Howard just sends Kim back to Doc Review. This is Kim's final straw that makes her consider leaving HHM. Howard can seem like a real ass here, but again, he's influenced by Chuck, whether anyone wants to admit it or not. Yes, Howard does care about HHM's image, but if Chuck weren't in the picture, there's no way Howard would be treating Kim like this. Howard goes to Chuck's late at night to share a drink and celebrate them getting Mesa Verde as a client. Howard admits that it was Kim's doing, and Chuck responds by condescendingly asking Howard if she's out of the doghouse, but in such a way where he implies that he'll be disappointed if she is. These small clues just help prove Chuck's extortion against Kim and Jimmy, even when he can't admit it to himself, let alone anyone else. Chuck then goes to HHM early in the morning while it's still dark out, and it's revealed that Kim's still there working doc review from the night before. This is where we have a very memorable Kim and Chuck one-on-one -on -one conversation. To be honest, this convo is so interesting that I could focus an entire video on it, so I'll just give the cliff notes. Chuck explains about his past with Jimmy to Kim, including Jimmy's lifelong past of reoccurring actions. Half of this convo is Chuck trying to sabotage Kim and Jimmy's relationship, while the other half of this convo is Chuck genuinely trying to explain Jimmy's character to Kim. This is one of my favorite Chuck scenes ever, and I kind of wish that Kim and Chuck had more more solo screen time together, although I understand why they don't. But maybe that's why I like this scene so much, because something like this just doesn't happen often. This episode ends off with a walking, talking Hector Salamanca finding Mike at his regular restaurant in order to try and convince him to say that Tuco's gun was actually his, in order to shorten Tuco's sentence. I love seeing Hector like this in the prequel, and it's an amazing way to end off the episode. I'm gonna give this episode a B tier. Although this is a building episode, we get Kim's first connection to Mesa Verde, we get her reasons for quitting HHM, and we get the memorable conversation with Chuck. We also get our first real introduction to Rebecca, who's incredibly important to Chuck's story. Plus, Hector appearing at the end to confront Mike was great. 
Season 2, Episode 6, Bally High. This episode starts with Jimmy watching TV, and he sees the old Davis and Main commercial airing instead of his. Jimmy also starts messing around his company apartment out of boredom. He eventually goes to sleep in his old nail salon office, showing how uncomfortable he is with his new apartment. Kim gets ready to leave for work, and listens to a live voicemail from Jimmy weirdly singing, but then leaves once he actually starts talking. Jimmy eventually gets interrupted with the nail salon lady questioning why he's there. As Jimmy leaves, he once again gets frustrated that his coffee mug won't fit in his company car. Seems like Kim is finally at a dock review, but Howard notices that she hasn't unpacked yet. Seems like Chuck's convo with Kim at the end of the last episode caused Howard to move her back but on the way to talk to Kevin and Paige, Kim tells Howard that she never asked Chuck to be moved back. This shows that Chuck is just about done with using Howard as his puppet, and he prefers to continue his vendetta against Kim and Jimmy himself. Kim loses against Schweikart and Coakley in court, with Howard not even showing up to support Kim. Afterwards, Rich tells Kim that he's impressed with her going down swinging and invites her to lunch. Rich relates to Kim's situation and says that he's been abandoned by his bosses for a court case too, and that he knows what it's like to show up alone. Rich then offers Kim a job working for him. This whole situation really made me come around to loving Rich's character the first time I saw these episodes, and as I've stated earlier in the season 1 tier list, I do really like Rich's character. I just love the actor what can I say, and it definitely helps that he has a great script to work off of. Later on, Kim then returns to the restaurant that she went to lunch at with Rich, and finds someone to con as Giselle. She invites Jimmy over, and they go on to con him. This shows that Kim is starting to love cons, and this is her first time initiating a con by herself. Considering Jimmy invited her to do this multiple times in the season 2 premiere, it's not surprising that he drops everything at Davis and Maine to rush over. And then afterwards, back at Kim's apartment with Jimmy, it seems like Kim is always wearing that same grey shirt with the blue sleeves whenever she's in slip and Kimmy mode. We saw it in the season 2 premiere with the bottle stopper, and here with the check, and also during the end of the season 5 finale. That shirt has to do with a sports team from where Kim grew up, so this implies that it has something to do with her past. This supports the theory that Kim wasn't all that ethical before she decided to become a lawyer. Kim informs Jimmy of Rich's job offer, but she hesitates due to feeling bad for feeling like she's the reason that Jimmy took the job at Davis and Maine. Jimmy reassures her that he took it because it was the right decision, and then they move on with their day. But as Jimmy goes to get into his company car, he removes the cup holder, forcing his coffee mug to fit. This is symbolic of Jimmy forcing himself to fit into Davis and Maine, a place that he should not be. Meanwhile, Mike arrives home to find Arturo sitting on his doorstep to once again pressure Mike into taking Hector's deal. Mike responds respectfully declines, so Arturo leaves. Mike then sets up his doormat to show footprints underneath so that he'll know if anyone shows up to his house without him knowing. Later that night, Mike returns home and checks his floor mat to see that people were at his home while he was gone. Mike slowly sweeps the house until he confronts Arturo and some other thug, beating them on their ass and scaring them off. Just like during episode 109 Pimento last season, I love it whenever the show makes Mike seem like a badass. I I love how Mike turns on the TV to lure them out, and that Billy Mays of all things is what's on TV. It's very ironic how Arturo admits to Mike that they were sent there to scare him, but Mike is the one that ends up scaring them. We were just supposed to scare you, that's all. You try harder next time. Mike then goes to clean the blood off his hands and his gun, showing that he's visibly shaking and that he's not as completely fearless as he initially shows. This is very realistic as the adrenaline in his body slowly drains. The next day, Mike is watching his daughter at the pool of the motel that she's staying at with Stacy, and Mike notices the Salamanca cousins threatening Katie's life. It's ironic because Mike brought them to the motel to make them feel more safe due to Stacy's false paranoia, but now Mike has put them in legitimate danger due to his own affairs. This also marks the first time that we see the Salamanca twins in Better Call Saul. Mike then goes to meet Hector at one of his businesses, and Nacho pats him down as he enters. I I love how alpha Mike acts towards the Salamancas, turning the tables on them to get what he wants. The price is 50. How about your payment is you get to live? Not enough. How you manage to live so long with a mouth like that? Hmm? 
That night, Nacho arrives at Mike's to pay him the 50k, but Mike gives him 25k back, saying that his problem is returning sooner than they thought. What's this? 25,000. What for? We made a deal. I didn't hold up my end. Your problem is coming back sooner than we expected. The 50k is what Hector is giving Mike for saying that Tuco's gun was his, and then Mike is giving Nacho half of Nacho's original payment to Mike for putting Tuco in jail, since Tuco is coming out of jail sooner than they thought. This episode gets a B tier. A lot of this episode is forgettable, but there's a few great moments, such as Rich offering Kim a job, along with Mike taking out two men at his house and then confronting Hector near the end of the episode. I also love the final few scenes of Jimmy and Kim talking about Schweikart and Coakley and Davis and Maine, along with Jimmy forcing his coffee mug to fit in his car. I was originally going to give this episode a C tier, but I really do like the Mike stuff more than I remember. And wow, I swear I'm not trying to make this season all B tier, it's just that this season is very middle of the road. Season 2 episode 7, Inflatable. This episode starts with a very important flashback to Jimmy as a kid in his father's corner store. This is the moment where Slip and Jimmy became a con man after watching his father get swindled. It hurt Jimmy to see his dad get taken advantage of, and also this man conning his dad gives Jimmy an ultimatum, be a wolf or a sheep. Since Jimmy doesn't want to be taken advantage of like his father, he chooses wolf as we all know. No. Jimmy only did this because his dad wouldn't listen to him, even though the con man proves that Jimmy was right. This moment has huge ramifications on the rest of Jimmy's life, starting with stealing money from his dad's till from now on, eventually becoming one of the reasons why his dad had to close his store, and then become so depressed that it led him to an early grave. This was also referenced in a previous episode, where Chuck tells Kim that Jimmy would always steal cookies out of the cookie jar, and that his parents would never believe Chuck due to how charismatic Jimmy is, feeling how much Chuck hates and envies Jimmy for his charisma. There are wolves and sheep in this world, kid. Wolves and sheep. Figure out which one you're gonna be. In the current timeline, we see Mike and Jimmy confronting Suzanne Erickson to tell her that the gun wasn't Tuco's. She clearly knows that Mike was threatened and paid off, but Mike won't admit it. Afterwards, Jimmy privately admits to Mike that he had his own run-in with Tuco, referencing the first two episodes of the show back in Season 1. Then when Jimmy arrives at Davison, Maine, he gets his assistant Omar to start writing a letter of resignation, but when Omar mentions that Jimmy won't get his bonus unless he's fired, Jimmy cancels his letter of resignation, and we get a huge montage of Jimmy purposely trying to get fired. This is where we got the introduction to Saul Goodman's iconic colorful suits, based off a wacky waving inflatable arm flailing two men, which is what the episode is named after. This is probably top 3 in regards to my favorite Better Call Saul montages, I love the editing and the music as Jimmy perfectly self-destructs his job. Jimmy uses flashy suits to be unorthodox, and ends up loving them so much that I guess he keeps them into Breaking Bad. Cliff finally fires Jimmy after the montage, but Cliff admits that he knows exactly what Jimmy was up to and that he did this purposely to keep his bonus. I feel really bad for Cliff here, as he's been nothing but helpful and considerate towards Jimmy. I love how Cliff confronts Jimmy about everything, and to be honest, that deserves its own video. Hey Cliff, for what it's worth, I think you're a good guy. For what it's worth, I think you're an asshole. We then see Kim writing up her own form of resignation to Howard at HHM, and Jimmy interrupts her to talk. Jimmy offers Kim for them to partner together. Kim asks Jimmy if he's going to be a legitimate or corrupt lawyer, to which Jimmy starts out by saying that he'll stick on the straight and narrow, but then he looks down at Marco's pinky ring, and he admits there's no point in doing this unless he can be himself, and that he's been trying to be what other people want for far too long. So Kim turns him down, for now. Jimmy also admits a half-truth, that he got fired from Davis in Maine, but he leaves out the fact that he did it on purpose. Saul arrives back at the nail salon that night with his Suzuki Esteem, and a U-Haul driven by Omar. Together, they barely manage to fit his new desk in, and Omar tries to stay positive about Jimmy's shitty little office. Jimmy creates a new voicemail message, but this time using his real voice instead of a fake secretary. The next day, we get Kim's intro meeting for her job at Schweikart and Coakley, and we get very important info in regards to her past that I discussed in a previous Kim video. At the end of the meeting, Kim calls Rich Howard by accident, but Rich takes it very well. There's also references to Kim's 
previous conversation with Jimmy earlier that episode, where Jimmy told Kim that Rich was just another Howard. Kim has a smoke on the Schweikart and Coakley rooftop parking lot, and rips up Jimmy's proposal for them to partner together. I love the cinematography for this scene as Kim does this and has her cigarette. Kim meets Jimmy at the nail salon as Jimmy's camera crew finishes up a meeting with him for future commercials. Kim gives Jimmy a counter offer where they'll work together on their own solo practices, but in the same office. This is quite the misdirection considering that Kim ripping up Jimmy's card offer originally implies that she was going to completely deny his offer. Meanwhile, Stacy shows Mike the new house that she wants to move into, and Mike says he'll cover it no matter the cost. Later that night, we see Mike staking out the business that Hector works in. This episode gets a B tier. It's a good episode, but I just remember it as the Jimmy gets fired from Davis and Main episode. It has a few nice moments, such as more about Kim's backstory, but that's about it. Season 2, Episode 8, Fifi. This episode starts with one of Hector's drug smuggling trucks being checked at the border, followed by the driver stopping alongside the road after he crosses the border to pick up a gun from a secret hiding spot. The driver sticks a popsicle stick into to the ground alongside many others, implying that he's done this many times. Kim and Jimmy eat hot dogs at a popular Breaking Bad location, where Jimmy convinces Kim to snatch up Mesa Verde before Howard does, which foreshadows their plot for the rest of the season. Kim goes to Howard to resign, but Howard had already heard about Schweikart and Coakley. Kim then subverts his expectations, saying that she'll become a solo practitioner, but Howard puts two and two together as he also knows about Jimmy leaving Davis in Maine. Howard is sad to see Kim go, but offers to pay for the rest of her school loans. We also get some backstory on Howard once wanting to be a solo practitioner, but that his father talked him out of it, and instead convinced him to add another H to the name of the building. Kim feels relief when she leaves Howard's office, but that ends quickly due to Howard purposely yelling to get Kevin from Mesa Verde on the line, and to cancel everything else. Clearly, Howard has adapted some of Chuck's passive aggressiveness and wants to get back at Kim for quitting by taking Mesa Verde from her. Kim runs back to her old office and calls Paige to inform her of recent events and to try and secure Mesa Verde for herself. Howard talks to Kevin on one line and Kim talks to Paige on her cell phone at the same time. We then see Kim pitch to Kevin and Paige over lunch why she's the correct choice for them over HHM. All things considered, she does a pretty good job. The safe choice for you would be HHM. I believe, however, that I am the right choice. Kim then meets Jimmy at the location that'll be their season 3 office space, and Kim gets excited over the fact that she thinks she scored Mesa Verde. Howard goes to visit Chuck, who we haven't seen in a quick minute. Howard updates Chuck that Kim left HHM, and that she's taking Mesa Verde with her, and that she's also getting an office with Jimmy. Howard asks for Chuck's help to keep Mesa Verde, and Chuck insists on coming to the Mesa Verde meeting himself. Howard doesn't think it's a good idea, but Chuck insists. This of course leads up to Jimmy switching the numbers on Chuck to make him look like a fool, and if Chuck would've just taken Howard's advice not to go, none of this would've happened. I like the nice touch of all the HHM workers doing a second take on Chuck walking down the stairs to meet Kevin and Paige, considering all the lights are still on in the building. Chuck tries playing reverse psychology to Kevin and Paige, saying how Kim is the correct choice. Chuck also says how the slightest of errors can be a huge deal, and that they need a sharp young eye to catch that stuff. Again, Chuck is unintentionally foreshadowing the number switch. Once Kevin and Paige leave, Chuck nearly falls over and asks to be taken home, showing how much pain he suffered adjusting to try to take Mesa Verde from Kim due to his vendetta against Jimmy. Meanwhile, Jimmy gets one of his elder clients who owes him to commit stolen valor in order to get shots of him in front of the bomber plane called Fifi, which the episode is named after. They quickly grab a few shots of the elder standing in front of the bomber before their chaperone can get back with some water. Jimmy gets a call from Ernie concerned about Chuck's condition. Jimmy correctly guessed that Chuck's been going into the office and gives Ernie advice on how to take care of him. Jimmy meets Kim back at the new office to sign the lease, but Kim is outside moping due to losing Mesa Verde. Kim admits that it was Chuck who convinced Mesa Verde to stick with HHM, Jimmy still wants the office with her. Jimmy puts two and two together, realizing that Chuck risked his health to go to the office to steal Mesa Verde from Kim, and he's low-key pissed. Jimmy goes to see Chuck that night, and Ernie is still there, saying Chuck hasn't gotten any better. 
Since Chuck is in no condition to speak, instead of helping him, this time Jimmy uses it to his advantage to sabotage Chuck. Jimmy takes the Mesa Verde files, writes down with sticky notes where they're supposed to go, and then leaves Chuck alone. This is where Jimmy goes to the photocopy store, and we get a montage of him switching the numbers from 1261 to 1216 on every single document that has it. Jimmy then returns to Chuck to return the documents to their proper place in Chuck's files. Jimmy then sits and waits until morning until Chuck wakes up. This time I'm not sure if Jimmy does it because he cares, or if he does it because he feels obligated to stay since he let Ernie leave. Jimmy confronts Chuck about Mesa Verde, but Chuck just thanks Jimmy for looking after him, which is honestly such a manipulation tactic. We once again see Mike staking out Hector's Mexican food joint, then later on we see him tailing Hector's men to see how they hide the drug money. Mike then gets his granddaughter to help him with making holes in a hose, then he washes off any fingerprints on the hose. This episode ends with Mike shoving spikes in the holes in the hose with gloves on to create a spike strip that we'll see him use in the next episode. Say it with me, this episode gets a B tier. Although this episode includes the iconic moment of Jimmy switching the numbers, it's mostly just set up for the final two episodes of the season. Season 2, Episode 9, Nailed. This episode starts with Mike nailing down his spike strip for his truck heist. Mike ties up and robs the same truck driver that we've seen him staking out throughout the season, stealing Hector's drug money from their hidden spot in the tires. I love this heist, along with the ramifications it has for future episodes and even the next season. Great way to start off the episode. Mike then goes back to staking out Hector's Mexican restaurant, where he sees Hector freaking out at Arturo and Nacho. We then see Mike at his favorite bar buying a round for the house with Hector's money to celebrate. The next day, we see Mike at his favorite restaurant again, where he gets a phone call from Nacho saying they need to talk. Mike and Nacho meet at their regular season 2 spot, and Nacho calls out Mike for robbing the truck, as he knows that Mike doesn't like to kill people when others would. Anyone in the game would have capped him without a second thought, but this driver, he's still breathing. I thought to myself, who's the guy who'll rip off a couple hundred thousand in drug money and leave a witness? Who's the guy who won't pull the trigger? You. Again, Nacho calls out Mike for his half-measure mentality. Nacho is worried that the driver is in on it, but to his surprise, Mike admits that he worked completely alone. Mike asks why the heist wasn't in the papers, and Nacho just informs him that the cops don't know about it. Nacho gets worked up over Mike wanting to sick the cops on Hector, as that'd mean bad news for Nacho too, but as Nacho goes to reach for his gun, Mike manages to calm him down. Nacho then admits that they were able to clean up the heist before the cops found it, because a good Samaritan saw the truck on the side of the road and stopped to help. This resulted in the truck driver calling Nacho's crew, but when they arrived, they killed the good Samaritan, which is now innocent blood on Mike's hands, the one thing he didn't want. This is yet another step for Mike's corruption into his full measure mentality that we know him for in Breaking Bad. Meanwhile, Chuck gets ready to go see Mesa Verde with Howard, who again insists that Chuck stays put and doesn't come. Literally every time Chuck goes into the office to do something for his vendetta against Jimmy and Kim, Howard tries to stop him, but Chuck always always insists, this time saying, I'm just worried about your comfort. I find victory laps very comforting. Huh. How smug. Jimmy watches them leave from behind a nearby tree. Chuck arrives at the courthouse and we get this brilliant scene of him walking through a metal detector. Chuck and Howard represent Mesa Verde applying for their bank expansions, but they get interrupted for the discrepancy of the address. The Mesa Verde movement gets delayed by six weeks, with the commissioner saying they have to go back to square one. Chuck overreacts over a small minute detail, with his reaction becoming worse than the mistake itself, not only with the commissioner, but also Kevin and Paige. You are mistaken, and with all due respect, you're muddying the waters here. Muddying the waters? Although this is Jimmy's doing, Chuck also jinxed himself from his previous conversation with Kevin and Paige, saying that they need a young eye to catch small errors such as this. The scene ends with Chuck's condition affecting him, showing that his condition gets worse when things don't go his way. Once Howard brings Chuck back home, Chuck starts freaking out. He quickly puts two and two together, realizing that Jimmy was behind this. We see Jimmy and Kim pushing out the dental chairs at their new office, along with ripping down the wallpaper and painting a new color. Kim gets a call from Paige, who rehires her. Jimmy congratulates Kim, acting innocent, although he knows that he's the cause of this. Holy shit, that's unbelievable! <laughs> <laughs> 
I, what happened to HHM? I Ernie then calls Kim to bring her the Mesa Verde files, but when Kim and Jimmy get to Chuck's to get the files, Ernie has to let him in as Chuck has changed the locks. This is a clue towards Jimmy that Chuck is on to him. Chuck clears the air by calling Jimmy out for sabotaging him. Chuck calls the Mesa Verde delay the worst moment of his professional life, but just wait until we get to the chicanery of all of it next season. Chuck knows that Jimmy is capable of this due to creating fake IDs in high school and perfectly calls out Jimmy for stealing his papers the night he was out of commission, going to an all-night photocopy store, and forging fake copies to replace the real ones before Chuck woke up. Chuck says that he can't stand the fact that he was stabbed in the back by his brother, which is incredibly hypocritical considering that's what Chuck has been doing to Jimmy the whole show and even ever since Jimmy first moved to Albuquerque. Chuck wants Kim to go and admit the truth to Kevin, but but when Kim finally speaks up after not talking the entire scene, she backs up Jimmy's fake innocence and says that she believes Chuck just made a mistake. And holy crap, I love what Kim says here. He's capable of this, you know he is! I know he's not perfect, and I know he cuts corners, but you're the one who made him this way. God damn, Chuck needed to hear that for the past two seasons, and I'm glad someone finally said it to his face. He idolizes you, he accepts you, he takes care of you, and all he ever wanted was your love and support. I can't believe that I completely forgot about Kim's speech in this moment because wow, this moment speaks volumes in regards to the Chuck versus Jimmy dynamic. But all you've ever done is judge him. You never believed in him. You never wanted him to succeed. And you know what? I feel sorry for him. Although what Kim says is true, she also knows that Chuck is right, and that Jimmy did switch the numbers, so we see her punching him as soon as they get back into the car after loading up the Mesa Verde files. We get a Beatles album homage as Jimmy and the camera crew walk across the street to commit their next con at an elementary school in order to use their flag as a background set for his next commercial. This is very forgettable, but then again, I like seeing the camera crew any chance we get. Later that night, Jimmy tells Kim to make sure to walk his new commercial the next day as he's very excited for it. Jimmy asks Kim if she wants to talk about the Chuck situation and Kim says not now, not ever. Jimmy talks anyways a little bit saying that her and Mesa Verde were meant for each other. As Jimmy rolls over to go to sleep, Kim says that Chuck is an amazing lawyer and a great adversary. Jimmy agrees, causing Kim to continue saying that Chuck will find any crack in his defense, implying that Jimmy should go cover his tracks. So this makes Jimmy get up out of bed and go to the 24-7 photocopy store to cover his tracks. He sees Ernie just leaving, so he hides until Ernie is gone and then goes in himself. Jimmy pays off the employee to keep his mouth shut and erase the camera footage from him ever being there. Jimmy then waits across the street and watches Chuck show up to interrogate the photocopy store employee. Chuck gets agitated as the employee admitted to seeing Jimmy to Ernie, but is now denying it to Chuck. As Chuck tries to be all high and mighty, Ernie suggests that they should leave. Chuck talks back Back to Ernie, telling Ernie to not treat him like a child. Then, like clockwork, as soon as something doesn't go Chuck's way, symptoms of his condition start acting up as Chuck focuses on all the electronics around him. Chuck tries shaking it off, and low-key keeps harassing the employee. The employee even asks Ernie if Chuck is okay, and Ernie again insists on them leaving. Chuck rudely tells Ernie to shut up, wow. And then another customer interrupts this to get the employee's help, but Chuck continues to freak out saying that they're in the middle of a conversation. It gets to the point that the employee walks away to help the other customer, telling Ernie to get Chuck out of there or he's gonna call the cops. Chuck gets so worked up that things aren't going his way that his symptoms get so bad to the point that he collapses and nails his head hard on the counter on the way down. We are then left with a cliffhanger of Jimmy witnessing this, debating on whether or not to run in and help. This episode gets an A tier. Yay, we broke the B tier streak. I like Nacho and Mike's confrontation. I love the Chuck vs. Jimmy and Kim confrontation, and the episode literally ends with a smack on the head. Season 2, Episode 10, Click. This episode starts with a slight misdirection. It begins by showing Jimmy sitting beside a hospital bed, making you think that this is the outcome of the previous episode's cliffhanger with Chuck hitting his head. It's only when the doctor walks away that we get the reveal that Chuck is in the chair beside Jimmy and not in the bed. So who's in the bed? Episode starts with a blue filter, which implies that this is a flashback. It's revealed that it's their mom lying on her deathbed. Chuck and Jimmy have been by her side for hours, and Jimmy decides to go get them food. Of course he leaves at the worst time, and their mom wakes 
up and calls out for Jimmy while he's gone, but the thing is she only calls out for Jimmy even though Chuck is trying to speak to her. When Jimmy returns, she's dead, and Chuck lies about her final words and tells Jimmy that she didn't say anything. I love this flashback so much. On one hand, this is incredibly cruel and selfish of Chuck to do this due to his resentment and jealousy towards Jimmy. On the other hand, and this might be giving Chuck more credit than he deserves, if Chuck would have told Jimmy about their mother's final words, Jimmy probably would have never forgiven himself for not being there for her when she wanted him to be. So this was mostly a selfish, horrible act that Chuck made, but it does have another perspective to look at where Chuck may have also been protecting Jimmy even if it's unintentional. Back in the present timeline, we resume the real cliffhanger from the last episode, and Jimmy blows his cover and springs into action to care for Chuck. No matter what's going on in the Jimmy vs. Chuck vendetta, Jimmy always ends up putting his love for his brother above anything else when Chuck doesn't. Chuck eventually realizes this and uses this to his advantage by the end of the episode. The ambulance brings Chuck into the hospital, and I love how well they show the discomfort that Chuck is experiencing due to his condition. And I do feel really bad watching this, as Chuck begs them to not run tests on him, tries yelling out about his condition, and he says he doesn't give them consent, but they do their regular routine anyways. We get another appearance of Dr. Cruz from season 1, as Jimmy waits outside Chuck's hospital room. She tells Jimmy that nothing has changed since the last time that he was in the hospital, but Jimmy puts his foot down saying he won't commit Chuck. They work out a temporary guardianship in order to get Chuck out of the hospital, and when Jimmy goes to tell Chuck, Chuck just hauls for Ernie. Is Ernesto out there? Yeah, I get you some. Ernesto, come in here, please. Yeah, just take it easy. Ernesto! Chuck then gets Ernie to cooperate the fact that Jimmy showed up at the photocopy store mere moments after Chuck hit his head, meaning that Jimmy was watching the whole thing. Chuck knows everything that Jimmy has done, from switching the Mesa Verity numbers to paying off the photocopy employee, but Chuck just can't prove it. Jimmy only cares about Chuck's well-being in this moment, while Chuck only cares about calling Jimmy out for his cons and shortcuts. Even Ernie wants Chuck to calm down, to the point that he lies for Jimmy completely unprovoked. Ernie is the goddamn MVP, wow. I really wish Ernie was in later seasons more. Chuck knows that Ernie is lying though, and tells them both- Get out. Both of you. Before Jimmy leaves, he tells Chuck about the temporary emergency guardianship, and then Chuck says that Jimmy finally has him where he wants him. But I feel like Jimmy's mindset has changed since season 1, where he cares more about Chuck's health than using him for a cash out from HHM. After Jimmy and Ernie leave the room, Ernie admits to Jimmy that Chuck is really out to get him, but that Ernie considers Jimmy a good friend, so that's why he lied for him. To end the scene, we get one of my favorite Ernie lines with him saying, I miss the mail room. I love Chuck's analogy in regards to comparing a penicillin allergy to his electronic allergy, but I also agree with the doctor that they aren't quite the same. Chuck eventually agrees to get a CAT scan or a CT scan, and I feel for him here. While Chuck gets tested on, Kim joins Jimmy in the waiting room. Right as Jimmy stands up to go get an update on Chuck's condition, the Gimme Jimmy commercial plays on the waiting room TV. Kim is really impressed, but Jimmy is too upset over Chuck to bask in the glow. The doctor comes out to tell them that Chuck is relatively okay, and that he passed out in the photocopy store due to a panic attack. When they go to see Chuck, he appears to be awake but unresponsive. Jimmy is pissed, but the doctor says that Chuck will be back to normal as more time passes. The next day, Chuck starts responding like a somewhat normal human being again, waking up to find Jimmy sitting beside him. Chuck assumes that Jimmy is going to commit him, but Jimmy just brings Chuck home, implying that the temporary emergency guardianship is over. Once they make it back to Chuck's, Jimmy insists on making him tea but Chuck tells Jimmy to leave as he's still pissed off at him for switching the numbers and bribing the photocopy store employee. Chuck tries acting better than he really is, but Jimmy still insists on getting Ernie to look after Chuck instead of leaving him alone. After Jimmy leaves, Chuck grabs his space blanket and his lantern and goes outside to his garage, which he uses for storage. He goes to grab something, but we don't see what it is yet, and to be honest, I completely forgot that scene existed. We see Jimmy back to work with the elders at his new office, telling Kim how they need a receptionist, foreshadowing Francesca in Season 3. Kim tells Jimmy that Howard's been trying to get a hold of him all day, and that something serious is up about Chuck, but he won't say what exactly. Jimmy rushes over to Chuck's, but Chuck doesn't want to let him in as he's busy. Obviously, this is just a ploy. Jimmy keeps banging on the door until eventually Chuck lets him in. Jimmy enters the tin foil house. This is where Chuck manipulates Jimmy using Jimmy's affection for him. Chuck freaks Jimmy out by pretending to retire from HHM, 
along with clearly blowing his condition out of proportion to make himself seem crazy, or even more crazy. Jimmy tries convincing Chuck not to retire, along with asking why Chuck is doing this. Chuck gives a sob story about how he can't do his job correctly anymore because he messed up the Mesa Verde numbers. Of course Chuck doesn't really believe this, as he knows that Jimmy switched the numbers, but Chuck is pretending to believe this con to guilt Jimmy into feeling bad for him due to Jimmy knowing that he caused all of this. Chuck is doing some textbook reverse psychology here again by saying that he feels bad for blaming Jimmy for his own mistake, along with pretending that it's making his condition worse. I love the acting that Michael McKean does here as Chuck, it's truly amazing especially when you realize Chuck is faking it. Jimmy falls for this hook line and sinker, slowly starting to admit that he did switch the numbers on Chuck. Jimmy then takes the words right out of my mouth. It is insane how you got every detail exactly right. Jimmy admits that he did it all for Kim, due to Chuck hurting Jimmy through Kim all season long. Jimmy admits that he thought Chuck would go, oh well, and move on, but of course Chuck has the itch of never letting Jimmy get away with shortcuts. Now that Jimmy admitted to what he did, he wants Chuck to cancel his retirement and take all the tinfoil space tarps off the walls, but all Chuck has to say is to confirm that Jimmy just admitted to a felony. Jimmy says yes, but that hopefully it made Chuck better. As the episode ends, the camera pans over to a secret tape recorder that Chuck had hidden in plain sight. This is what Chuck was searching around in his garage for. What a cliffhanger to end the season off with, holy crap. Meanwhile, the truck driver that Mike robbed is taken out to a desert by Nacho and Arturo to meet Hector and the twins. Mike watches in his car from afar. Mike then ends up calling back the gun seller from Breaking Bad to test shoot a few sniper rifles. At first he wanted to buy a sniper for Tuco, but now it's for Hector. The next day, Mike goes to a sniper perch on top of a rock and scopes out the Salamanca a safe house in the desert. He sees Hector, the twins, Nacho, Arturo, and the truck driver he ambushed. He watches the truck driver get killed, but can't get a clear shot on Hector as Nacho is unintentionally standing in the way. Mike realizes that he could kill Hector with a collateral shot, but doesn't want to take Nacho out with him. Before Mike can take his shot against Hector, he hears a loud car horn blaring behind him. Mike runs back to his car to realize that it's his own horn, stuck on blast due to a stick shoved against it. He removes the stick and finds an ominous note on his front window that just simply says, Don't. This was a huge cliffhanger to end off Mike's story for Season 2, and it really had me wanting to come back for Season 3. It was widely speculated that Gus was behind the note, considering the Frings Back episode titled Easter Egg, which viewers discovered early into the season, or even before the season came out, I think. They're still doing Easter eggs like this, such as the Season 6 trailers hinting at the April 18th release date. The episode gets a strong A tier. I kinda wanted to put it in S tier, but to be honest, it just barely doesn't cut it. I'd only be putting it in S tier because of Mike and Jimmy's own respective cliffhangers, but that's it. To be honest, there's a lot of slow Chuck recovery scenes, with one or two that I had completely forgot even existed. That being said, I liked the flashback to Jimmy and Chuck's mom, I liked the Mike don't cliffhanger, and I loved the Chuck vs. Jimmy cliffhanger. So this season was very middle of the road for me, mostly B's with an A and an S and a C. I will admit that I enjoyed season 2 slightly more than I thought I would while rewatching it, but that's only due to all the foreshadowing that I now know pays off well in future seasons. Season 2 seems very much like a setup season for the rest of the show, since they just finally knew what direction they wanted to take the show in. The first season almost seemed like a test season, while season 2 seems like the real season 1. Season 2 might possibly take the crown for my least favorite Better Call Saul season, but that doesn't necessarily mean it's bad. It just means I prefer all the others slightly more. But that being said, there's still another future season that might take the crown, but we'll compare it to season 2 when we get to it. I've always remembered liking season 2 less than season 1, but now I'm not too sure. I guess considering the rankings, I do. Here's both tier lists side by side, and here's both season 1 and season 2 episodes combined into one tier list. Anyways, that's the end of my tier list, how do you rank the episodes? Let me know in the comments below. I'd appreciate a like on the video if you've enjoyed anything that I've said today, and if you're new to the channel or just haven't yet already, subscribe and hit that bell notification to stay updated on when I post new content on Better Call Saul and Breaking Bad. I thank you all so much for watching, and until next time, I'll talk to you guys later. Peace out! Barrel. Boom, boom. Just like that. <laughs>
<risa> Se los dije. Tiene unos huevotes. Whoa, whoa, hold on. What the hell happened to you? I get it. The first rule of Fight Club, right? Jesus, what? Ah, Kim, what? Just drive. A chip with a machine gun, that's me, right? Take your desk and get out. But oh no! Wishful thinking! Click.